big thank you to Secretary Bransell, the historical uh, perspective and the reality check, always incredibly interesting and, and utterly relevant. So um, my name is Carol Barford. I'm the director of the Center for Sustainability in the Global Environment, which is part of the Nelson Institute here on campus. And I will be moderating uh, the rapid fire session and the uh, discussion afterward. Uh, first is Paul Mitchell, Chris Kucharik, Associate Professor in Agronomy and also in SAGE where I work. And then after Chris will be Aaron Silva, Associate Director uh, of the Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems and Jeffrey Orr, who is the Executive Chef of University Housing, uh, Dining and Culinary Services. So these are going to go lickety split. Uh, first of all is uh, Professor Mitchell. So I'm going to talk about what farmers think about climate change. And does this go on? Well, I'm going to do this one. Farmers are at ground zero for climate change. It's sort of my um, attitude on this. And just picked a couple pictures off the internet of standard, stereotypical farms. Ma and pa farmer with the next generation there next to them and the dog. Or the Wisconsin Busher, Buffer Initiative there with, um, you can tell who the farmers are. And then there's the guy from the city. I think it's from the Nature Conservancy, um, you know, coming out to help them manage the manure. Farmers manage much of the land. 1.9 billion acres in the lower 48. 61% is used for agriculture. That's 400 plus million in crops and another 600 plus in pasture. So that's, where the, that's who manages the land. They're using it and that it's mostly privately managed. They're vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Drought of 2012 nationally costs over 17 billion just in indemnities for crop farmers. Floods, cold, heat, hail. Um, there's pictures of all that stuff happening there. Snow too early, snow too late. Um, those all have costs. They're the ones who can pay it. We just turn on the air conditioner, turn on the heat. Um, it's a little pain to get to work some days. They will be implementing mitigation and adaptation policies on their land. They're the ones who are going to put the, um, the windmills up. Why don't researchers ask farmers what to think about climate change? Back in 09, we were doing a survey. We were asking a lot of things about technology, farm policy, and one of us said, you know, why don't we do something about climate change? We started looking around and nobody had been asking. So we, we were kind of strained, so we decided to put a question on our survey, well, some questions about farm um, climate change. So we did, well, let's ask farmers. So this is the paper that just came out, took a while. It was a mail survey in 2009 of about 1,000 farmers, um, about 388 from Wisconsin, the other states are there. North Carolina would be Rod Jesus, that's his graduate student, Keith Coble, Mississippi State, and Tom Knight, Texas Tech. Um, and we just got it published. The vertical axis is the percent that agree or strongly agree with this, this statement. It's shortened up from the actual survey, but climate change is scientifically proven. About 25% of the farmers agreed. Um, North Carolina was a high at about 36%. So they don't believe climate change has been proven. Um, and wait for the thing to do the next one. Um, but it, it agrees, with, agrees with what um, Secretary Bransell said. Humans are changing Earth's climate. Oh, we got a little bit more there, 35 36%. Texas is low at 25%. North Carolina high at 46, 47 percent. Um, yeah, they, they have some effect, but there must be something else going on. Um, they don't really strongly, it's still less than half. So again, consistent with what Secretary Bransell said. Normal weather patterns explain recent events. We didn't even name what the recent events were, but you can see much higher. Mississippi was up in 75 plus percent. Wisconsin there on the far right, uh, 67, 68 percent. So it's just normal weather variation. Um, it's, there's nothing unusual going on here. Um, it's just part of the normal way things are. This is consistent with other research. There's a paper just came out about this, a little bit after us, Arbuckle et al. from Iowa State. National survey, 5,000 farmers in 2012. 60% are in those bottom three. Climate change is mostly natural, uncertain about climate change. Climate change is not happening. That's what, that's what their results are. So US agriculture and climate change, farmers are climate change skeptics. My experience suggests that most members of the ag industry, input suppliers, handlers, the whole processors, everything, they're all climate change skeptics. Um, it's kind of become a political issue. Climate change is like some other things. It's not a scientific issue. It's a, it's a political position. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, I mean, so what, what does it mean? Climate change and mitigation adaptation are, must engage farmers and agriculture where they are at, not where you want them to be. Um, that's kind of what um, Brant, Mr. Bransell was saying. Um, this engagement is necessary for success. This engagement will change you. You're not going to be the same person. You're going to have to go out and learn what they're thinking about. You just can't outsource it to somebody else. Climate change needs, to be rel needs relevant professors. This is just an op-ed piece from the 15th of this month, um, New York Times. Professors, we need you. Some of the smartest thinkers on problems at home and around the world are university professors, but most of them just don't matter in today's great debates. 
what, what the heck, what's this Wisconsin idea we're supposed to be dealing with here? I, it should matter. We should be relevant. Um, I'm involved in something called NISA, National Initiative for Sustainable Agriculture, started here on campus. We're going out and engaging with farmers. We're pushing to make the climate change just a small part of it. Engages with farmers to help them define sustainable cropping practices for their region, analyze the self-assessment data, give specific recommendations for improvement, and I forget the last one. Um, <laughs> basically what you do is you ask farmers to help them define what they believe is sustainable practices on their land, and then you score them relative to their own self-defined metrics, and you, help, you give them straight feedback. How well did you do on your own metrics? Um, accomplishments, we've done several crops, over 400,000 of those crop, acres of those crops, about a million acres in the, um, on the whole farm basis. You get these scores. This is a histogram of the scores. You get some leaders at the front who are high practice adopters. You get a bunch of laggards at the end that are low practice adopters. But we know who those people are, and you can help them improve, set research and um, outreach priorities. You can give specific practices and where they rank each. That's like a scorecard for an individual grower. So here's my sense. Is the individual farmer capable of dedicating private land to uses which profit the community, even though they may not so clearly profit, um, may not the practices won't profit him. Sorry. We may be over hasty and assuming he is not. I, farmers are, actually care about this stuff. You just have to go out and talk to them and be in their world. Um, try to get that right. It's hard to speak in Elder Leopoldese. Um, it's the old 1930 styles of writing and talking. But yeah, he said, yeah, we have to go out and engage with them and meet them where they are. And I think farmers are, they are stewards of land. They care about it. And it's incumbent upon us to do that, to meet them where they are and help them move forward on sustainability, which to me, climate change is just a part of it. So that's my last 20 seconds. Great, all right, so I'm gonna talk about a, a five-year funded project by the National Science Foundation uh, in their water sustainability and climate program. I listed the co-PIs, the great people I get to work with. This is a vision for the future for the watershed here, the Ahara, and a framework for assessing the impacts of land use and climate change. So here in the Ahara, it's an urbanizing agricultural watershed. 50% of the land use is ag. Um, we all know that the lakes here are environmental centerpiece. Unfortunately, with all that agriculture that's going on, we have significant problems with nutrients, nutrients leaving the landscape in the form of non-point source pollution, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus. Uh, Secretary Bransell already alluded to some of this. Large amounts of manure being applied to the landscape, sometimes on frozen ground, just like what we have going on now, lead to the water quality problems that we have here uh, close to home. Uh, for those of you that live here. Um, a long-term perspective, we just didn't get here overnight. Um, a lot of what has happened um, to our ecosystems are shaped by changes over many time frames. Uh, we think about the future, it's what we do today and as we move forward is gonna shape the history and the legacies of the next generations. Um, in this project, we're thinking very long-term, out 60 years, out to 2070. I'll be 100 years old then. We're thinking about ecosystem services, how might they be improved, sustained, maybe diminished as climate, land use, and human demands all change together. Um, it's a really tough problem to think about. And how do we address such problems? Well, in this particular project, and as NSF wants us to do, join different teams of people, social scientists, natural scientists, the arts and the humanities, to get talking to one another to understand where the intersection is moving forward and what sustainability really means for this watershed and how do we get there. Now as a natural scientist, how do we study these, these ecosystems? I can go out, or not me, it's actually my grad students uh, in these photos, collecting data, soils, water quality, why might I be able to do remote sensing of the landscape uh, to collect the data to understand how they're functioning today. But what about how do they respond to future changes and drivers? And how will the watershed respond to those changes? If you think about combining changes in land use, changing climate, there's a big question mark. How, how will these impact the flow of water and nutrients through the watershed? How do we go about studying these complex problems? What do, you, what do we use? We rely on numerical modeling tools very fancy computer code that ab abides by the laws of physics, understands something about biology and ecology, so we can play out different scenarios of what m things might look like in the future. And the reason we use models is we can't carry out an experiment over the whole watershed. 
But you might think about what are the future pathways of change for this watershed? I can't run all the possibilities with the models we have. We need something to guide our thinking for the future, and we rely on scenarios uh, to guide our modeling as we move forward. So what are integrated scenarios, and how do we use them? So in this particular project, we've interviewed the stakeholders, farmers, uh, the big thinkers in the region, to come up with four clusters of beliefs about pathways of the watershed out 60 years from now. So each narrative that has uh, resulted from this is a story about one of those pathways. And I'm going to run through each one of those four stories briefly here. So the first that has emerged is something called connected communities. Management that's focused on long-term viability of communities and the living systems on which they depend. It's a shift in human values towards qualitative well-being, fairness, connection, and sustainability. A second story is referred to as nested watersheds, where we have a movement, let's say, across the nation where the centralized management is employed at the watershed scale to adapt to severe variations in climate. So clean and sufficient water is the overarching goal in this particular story. The third story has to do uh, with abandonment and renewal. If you can think of a potential catastrophe that strikes the watershed and drives half of the population or more out of, out of this region, those that remain behind have a rebirth, a renewal of how farming takes place, back to maybe what we saw 150 or 200 years ago um, from 2070. And lastly, the fourth story is accelerated innovation, where the landscape is highly engineered for managing ecosystem services. It's high tech, high density development. That's actually the belt line there with uh, some type of rail system on top of it, if you can imagine that far ahead as a possibility. Now, these stories are really great to get people thinking about what the possibilities are for the future, what the space is, but those storylines need to be translated into something that our models can use. So specifically, what's the climate going to be like for each of those stories? What's the specific land use, land cover, urban extent, agriculture? This is a really tough thing to do to guide our models moving forward. So the framework overall is I've talked about these scenarios that have been dealt with engagement uh, with the community. They perform a, a, a baseline for our modeling tools. When we turn the big crank on our models, out comes some quantitative information about ecosystem services and how those are going to change over the next 60 years. The overall mission of this project really is to inform the democratic process of managing this watershed by using stories, past, present, and future, and enriching those stories with quantitative information. But the question remains is, are we giving the type of information that policymakers really need? Um, how do policy uh, decision makers really use information about water quality? And we're also trying to understand how the regional governance systems embedded in this watershed are organized to manage water. Will they actually use this information to make the watershed more resilient to future changes in climate and land use? So some of the opportunities and challenges, as I mentioned, are we giving those policymakers the information that they need at timescales that's relevant to the decision making? And uh, this is just a precursor to this project. We're about halfway through. We'll be right back here in this room on May 14th to more uh, elaborately detail these scenarios. And from that point, we're going to let the discussion unfold about what might look, what might look like uh, for the future for the watershed. So thank you. Thank you. So I'll be talking today about an Office of Sustainability funded project uh, looking at local food purchasing and do food miles relate to climate change. And this is in partnership with um, Jeffrey Orr, the executive chef from Housing Dining, and Jed Cahoon from the Department of Horticulture. We've seen this headline as well as other headlines highlighting um, the effects of extreme climate, including the polar vortex, which again we're experiencing today. And one of the headlines we have been seeing, current California drought is the driest in state's histories, and science fear mega droughts on their way. And see photos like this highlighting the impact of um, the extreme weather in California. Looking at agriculture, 90% of US lettuce production is in two states, California and Arizona. And this is just one example of the concentration of agriculture that we see in the US, where there are certain areas that produce the, the predominant volumes of produce that go into our grocery stores. 
In many of these production regions, they're, they're by virtue desert regions. And whereas they offer the sunlight needed to optimize plant growth, and they offer the low humidity that helps with plant disease management, they are very reliant on groundwater, on surface water. And not always is a technology advanced. In, in this example, has furrow irrigation. The USDA is increasingly focusing some efforts on local food systems and various initiatives like Know Your Farmer, Know Your Food, various grant programs that help fund research, outreach, and education, look at further developing and expanding our local food systems. These various initiatives um, are in part due to the interest in our various grocery stores, Walmart, Kroger, Costco, the definitions in terms of what they're calling local may vary, but there is emphasis and an interest in purchasing local foods, and more recently in our region with the Roundies grocery chains looking at investing local food in the Wisconsin area. In the beginning of February, I got a call from the New York Times wanting to get examples of dairy farmers that were now growing vegetables. And this is an example of farmers in our region capitalizing on this interest in local foods and diversifying and looking at where they can expand their markets and potentially integrate vegetable production into traditional dairy operations. The question remains, though, are consumers willing to pay for local foods? And there's been varying studies across the country, and depending on what commodity you're looking at and what region of the country, the interest varies, but it does appear that consumers are willing to pay a premium for local food products, again, driving the interest in grocery stores and further driving the interest of farmers. One of the arguments to expand local food systems comes in food miles, with looking at the distance traveled of conventionally sourced produce, our produce out of California, versus locally sourced produce. And this is, these are some examples from the Leopold Center in Iowa State, but you can see that there's a vast difference. The question remains, though, are local food systems more efficient? And empirical studies of food transportation and energy use don't agree as to whether or not the local food system with these reduced food miles are truly more efficient through various metrics. And is total energy use lowered in local food production when taking into account crop yields and fertilizer use? And indeed, looking at greenhouse gas emissions and life cycle analysis, there are additional inputs beyond food miles that are impacting the carbon footprint of local food systems versus a conventionally sourced produce from, from California. The production techniques, processing, efficiencies of distribution and storage all go into the analysis. And looking at a comparison of, for instance, conventional versus organic techniques, it varies depending on what commodity you're talking about. Some commodities, such as blueberries or wine grapes, the conventional production has more of an impact with respect to greenhouse gas emissions, whereas others, you see the converse, and organic production has more of an impact. So I would argue that one of the, the biggest benefits of local food with respect to climate change is in respect to risk mitigation. And again, from that first one of those first slides that I presented, looking at the concentration of production of some key crops in the US, we have an amazing concentration in some areas that are at risk, such as almonds, walnuts, pistachios, concentrated in California. So our project takes a microcosm of this and looks at local green, local purchasing. Um, in partnership, again, with Jeff Orr from Housing Dining and Cal's, looking at relating food values with um, obtaining these sustainability metrics, looking at case studies sourcing greens from various farm approaches across Wisconsin. So we've had various case studies come into the dining facility in Gordon Commons, lettuce from Crossroads Community Farm in Cross Plains, locally grown, certified organic on more of a mid-scale, focus on storage crops, from a family-owned farm from a former UW student. This information is presented to students as these greens are on the salad bar. Equinox Farm, um, similarly locally grown and certified organic, but John here is on a smaller scale, so different amount of tillage and cultivation. He focuses more on hoop house production, season extension, um, but again, another family-owned farm from a former UW student. Uh, furthermore, um, this week we've gotten in produce from KP Simply Fresh, quite a different operation. They're a greenhouse, so they're requiring additional energy use for heating and lighting. Um, again, locally grown, but they also have an integrated aquaponics system, so they're producing fish. Um, they're using conventional fertility inputs. Again, a family-owned farm. So the students are given this information with respect to being able to make purchasing decisions. 
So what we've learned, and I'll, I'll let Jeff um, talk about some of this on the panel, but there's different motivations of the chef with respect to local purchasing, the students and the farmers with their motivations of wanting to be engaged in the local food system. We found various barriers with respect to liability insurance that UW requires. Um, pricing is a continual challenge, and I can have Jeff speak to this on the panel, but uh, you know, this, this product costs more. Are the students willing to pay it? And that's part of the project in terms of determining student interest and what students' priorities are with respect to purchasing local or alternatively produced produce. And finally, quality. And again, from a chef perspective, this is key. Um, does local produce offer a higher quality product with respect to culinary qualities and with respect to nutritional qualities that the students are interested in? And how do these play in terms of the decision-making process and some of the trade-offs with respect to um, with price, with carbon footprint, et cetera? Thanks very much again to all of them as, as a group. Yeah, that was different. All right, sure. so we um, are going to have panel discussion for about 20 minutes, and uh, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. And also, I think you can feel free to address a question to Secretary Bransell, if you like, in addition to the panelists. That's what I was told. <laughs> um, so. Um, let me just begin by a really big overarching question, which is to say, uh, in the context of climate change, and also at the same time wanting to have a sustainable agriculture, a sustainable food system, what aspects or pieces really jump out at you? To, to uh, have a sustainable food system, we really need this. And that could be things that we do now, things that we will maybe do in the future, maybe things that we did in the past, like rotational cropping. In, in, the, in the great uh, realm of possibilities, what really pops out at you? Look, we need this. Yeah. Anybody? Um, I'll start just because I'm on the right next to you. <laughs> um, to me, it's the social aspect, sustainability. Um, the science will change as we discover new things. Um, so what we think is the most important thing today will change. But sustainability will always involve people. Um, and so understanding, and that's my own work is really founded you have to go out and meet the people and work with them that you want, whatever. You can invent the newest technology, but if no one will use it, it, it has no use. Um, I would, I guess I would say, um, with respect to the policy realm, policy to continue to support the diversity of agriculture here in Wisconsin. I mean, in terms of working in sustainable agriculture, there's no better place than Wisconsin with the vegetable production and both the conventional organic approaches to vegetable production, our livestock industry, our row crop producers. And I think it's really um, fostering that continued diversity that helps build a truly sustainable agriculture system. And that has to also be reflected within policy, both state and federal federal policy. So um, I, I think just continuing to support the diversity in the state is key. Questions from the audience. Hello. Thanks for being here today and everything. Um, I was just wondering what role you think that CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture, play in sustainability? That's an interesting question. Um, I and mean, that kind of ties into some of the issues with um, also you know, local food purchasing. It's definitely an example of local food purchasing. Um, you know, with respect to efficiencies, I, I think no matter what type of approach of farming, and CSAs can obviously be conventional uh, or organic, there's um, varying um, scales of where those, those farmers fall within um, their production practices. But uh, CSAs definitely contribute to um, the diversity in the state. And again, with the risk mitigation and um, diffusing the concentration of produce production from key areas like California, Arizona, Texas, um, allows for there to be many more farms that are growing a diversity of vegetables. I think that the, co the questions, I mean, ideally community supported agriculture, I would say the community would be more local and food miles would be reduced that way. But there are examples of 
CSAs that are coming from um, you know, the, the far s southwestern part of the state into Madison. So I mean, really, again, you know, in terms of it's not really a straightforward assessment in terms of impact of food miles, um, greenhouse gas emission, carbon footprint, et cetera. But in terms of enhancing the diversity in the state, they do play a key role in that, as well as connecting um, in terms of the societal issues, connecting community to farm. Well, and Aaron, you mentioned the risk mitigation helps to mitigate the financial risk of the growers too, knowing they've got the money up front and that they're, mm -hmm. uh, they raise the crops for the people who are their members. Um, and I think that uh, it also builds a trust and a relationship between the grower and the people. Uh, and one of my central themes on all this is, is accountability, um, that uh, the local relationship between the grower and the customer creates a, a relationship of accountability, the grower accountable to the community, and to its customers as well. I'd like to add to that. Aaron and I have been, we've done a survey and we've been looking at this and this is again, confirming what other people have found is, I mean, we have our CSA, I've gone out there, you meet the, you meet the guy, you go to his farm, pull weeds and plant um, cabbage in some days and stuff. But um, and once you start looking at the industry as a whole, it's no different than the rest of agriculture in that you have to be a good, you have to make money and there's a lot of turnover and financial stress in the industry. Um, and that's basically what we document, that yes, it, you have to make money and some of them aren't. And so they come in, do it for a while and leave. So sustainability does have an economic component. Um, that's um, at the grower level. This is a question for Professor Mitchell. Um, I think you got very interesting results. Uh, I think the first reading of your results would be like the farmers are not seeing the low frequency uh, climate change signal. Uh, and, and, and I think, why, why would they? I mean, in 20 years, in the short term, uh, natural variability dominates so much over climate change. Uh, based on that, I have a question. Uh, did you cross correlate your results for for example, political preference? Um, uh, is there yeah. a, like a flat signal, like Democrats and Republicans get like the same level of, uh, they are skeptical in the same way or not? Uh, yeah, I'll jump on. Um, a couple things. First is yes, we didn't ask direct political affiliation because that uh, often that'll just end the survey. And so we asked, um, <laughs> we asked about membership in different organizations and community involvement. You know, pick your Lions Club, National Farmers Organization, and you can kind of go through the list and American Farm Bureau. And some of those, you can okay, this is a Republican organization, this is a Democratic organization type of feeling. But in general, it, I, really, I think what you it, yes, there is some correlation with what kind of organizations they belong to, which probably ties to their politics, but. I think the one part I came out of there going, thinking, and it, it sort of, it, you have to take them where they're at. And you can't show up and tell them this is what you need to start doing and tell them, oh, you're just a Republican, you don't believe this, and that's stupid. You're gonna get nowhere. You have to come out and engage with them where they're at, who they are, and understand why they think that way. Um, maybe, the, and what you'll, kind of, like I said, it, this engagement will change you, is you'll start to see oh, I can understand what some of this stuff, why it makes sense from their world. Um, because my world is different than their world, their world is different than mine. We, and you have to somehow communicate. And, that's, and politics is just a part of it. Um, it's broader than that. that the rule, I, I, one thing I noticed is the, the difference between urban and rural is often bigger than rural in different parts of the country. We, we stereotype about the South or the West or the East Coast. I think there's more similarity between farmers in the South and farmers in the North in northern Wisconsin than there are between Madison and Atlanta. Uh, those, those farmers tend, I didn't say that right, but the urban rural split is a bigger split in the world or in the country than the, the regional splits between north, south, east, west. Um, it, it, just, it just is. That's my feeling. I don't have solid data, I guess. But. Thank you for being here. I have a, a question and a, and a comment. One of the thing is the farmers uh, know that there are new pests that they are moving into the area that we didn't have it before, such as Japanese beetle, that now they can survive. Uh, 
So uh, a comment on that one, you know, how the new pests are moving because of the climate change into the farmlands and they have to use uh, pesticides uh, to, to get rid of them. And then uh, there is lots of emphasis on organic food and now there is new way of thinking about limited uh, exposure chemical uh, food or lease of foods. Anyone wants to make a uh, remark on that one for our audience? I, I get, honestly, I haven't heard of that term. Um, as organic production specialist, I hadn't heard of the limited um, lease of foods. Uh, and there definitely have been, it's, it's two very good points, and there, farmers are, are definitely seeing um, different trends with respect to um, insect migration, insect populations in a time where those, in, those insects are impacting the fields. Um, in a spring like a couple of years ago, where it was very warm, it, it, we saw flushes of insects much earlier than we, we would have, and that impacted, for instance, the corn crop um, differentially. So it, it's something that, um, with respect to risk mitigation, that, that it, it adds an additional challenge to farmers. Um, and with respect to management recommendations and tools to, to help reduce that risk, uh, something that we as um, applied researchers at the university are going to have to continue to look at. Um, with respect to um, organic foods and um, pesticide exposure, um, and there's been some recent um, metadata analysis to look at um, different studies to, to document whether or not um, organic foods do have higher nutritional value um, or higher, lower pesticide. And whereas that is definitely a motivator of a certain segment of consumers, um, and, and probably with respect to people that are buying organic, um, maybe uh, the predominant um, sector of consumers. But really, I, I think in terms of when you look at motivators for consumers and their purchasing patterns of organic, it goes beyond pesticide exposure into um, uh, environmental um, reasons why they're choosing to buy organic, um, looking at farm size or, or other social reasons. Um, but organic, organic is truly um, a reflection of the production practices and doesn't necessarily speak to pesticide um, levels on the produce nor nutritional quality, and that's, that's very specific within the National Organic Standard. Um, so it's, it, it, I think in terms of you know, how consumers choose to buy organic, that's one motivation, but not the only motivation. Uh, this is perhaps for uh, Dr. Kacharik. Uh, four years ago, the uh, DNR adopted something called the uh, Adaptive Management Model for Improving Water Quality uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, what this allows is a regulated entity, regulated entities in the state that get discharge permits uh, account for about 30% of the pollution in our surface waters. The rest comes from surface runoff, either rural or, or urban, uh, or, and urban. Um, what it allows is the regulated entity, instead of in investing in um, ex uh, expensive uh, equipment to reduce their discharge, they can, they can instead uh, uh, enter into agreements with uh, other contributors that are not regulated, such as farmers or, or uh, uh, um, urban um, contributors. Have you seen, uh, Dr. Kucharik, uh, the, the hope was is that in Dane County, where the, where the uh, Yahara Lakes are, is that this would have a significant uh, impact on reducing phosphorus uh, in our lakes in, the, in, this, in this basin. Have you seen the, uh, an, an impact of that yet? Uh, and it, it would seem to be relate to what Dr. Mitchell was talking about in terms of having a, a policy that actually met farmers where it, it makes a difference. Right, yeah. So um, the best uh, story that I can give in terms of, you know, have we seen improvements? Have there been differences in loading of phosphorus? Um, there's research that has been conducted by uh, Dick Lathrop and, and Steve Carpenter, who's uh, Steve's a co-PI on this project, where they looked at uh, loading into the watershed over about a 33-year period, over which that period of time there were... Um, there was a, the Priority Watershed uh, Project. Uh, a lot of best management practices were trying to be implemented to reduce uh, the loading of those nutrients. And they saw no 
decline in the amount of pea that has been reaching the lakes, which was a bit of a surprise. But um, what they do think may be happening is due to the increased frequency of heavy rainfall events and events that are leading to more uh, sediment you know, runoff uh, from farms and that if those management practices hadn't been implemented, that the trend probably would have been going up through time. So it seems that maybe there's an indication that some of these changes are helping to keep the status quo, um, but no real improvement. Um, the best short-term story of the last few years was the drought of 2012, where Lake Clarity was actually the best it had been, if you looked at Mendota or Monona that year, and that was because of a reduction in the amount of runoff that was coming off of the surface. But then what happened the following year is that when we got uh, rains in, in spring of 2013, then it was kind of a double whammy that stored pee on the landscape was flushed uh, back into the system. So um, I don't know if that completely addresses the question, but we really have not seen uh, any changes to this point in time yet. Great, yes, um, this is, I can't resist. I look forward to the presentation on May 14th uh, of the scenarios, but I would like to pursue a question about the, the abandonment scenario and perhaps a little more detail about the type of environmental catastrophes that you could envision as possible and what would trigger that particular scenario. Yeah, well, guess what? I'm not at liberty to go into those details right now. <laughs> that was just a teaser. Where's Jenny Seifert, wherever she is? She's sitting there cringing right now. Um, so Jenny is our science writer and outreach coordinator, and all I'll say is that if you're very interested in knowing what the story holds, then please do show up here on May 14th. But <laughs> it may seem kind of crazy in that, but the whole idea of creating scenarios and um, is to, they're supposed to be provocative, very uh, outside of the box, things that will make your head spin around, like there's no way that that could happen. Well. If we sit here and, and, and only think about in our closed little minds about things that we're used to happening, we'll never make any progress moving forward. Um, and we're very fortunate on this team to have Steve Carpenter, who's probably the world's leading expert in integrated scenarios development. So um, I'm sorry I can't give any more details, but uh, uh, you will know by mid-May, yeah. Yes. Um I'd like to offer a scenario then. Um, the, some fairly mainstream science is suggesting that the state of Wisconsin could have the climate of Arkansas by the end of this century um, if our current efforts toward mitigation um, re remain as they are. Can the panel respond to how um, agriculture, agronomy, um, food production would be affected in terms of adaptation versus mitigation if indeed we were facing an Arkansas climate in this state? Well, I'll just say that um, <clears throat> personally, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of climate change research as gathering facts, how things have been changing, and I often don't like these comparisons with like you're going to be like this state or this region because we could enter in some type of a climate uh, analog that doesn't exist out there. So, but it is easier to talk to the public about, well, things could be like Arkansas. Well, if you look further south of where we're at, southern Illinois, uh, southern Iowa, northern Missouri, they've been growing crops there. They grow corn, they grow soybeans, their yields are higher than what we get here. Agriculture stands a very good chance of adapting to these changes. We've already been doing it uh, over the past 50 to 100 years, whether or not uh, farmers want to admit uh, that they have been adapting to those changes. And I speak to agricultural communities a lot about climate change, and I echo what Secretary Bransell has been saying here. Um, so I think, you know, as long as we don't fall off a cliff, you know, in terms of uh, climate, I think we could be okay. Um, I can't speak to if we're going to see large changes in, in the type of crops we're growing here, but I, I think we, we stand a fair chance of adapting to those changes through time. Uh, 
I can say from working with the organic agricultural community, um, Wisconsin is a leader in organic agriculture. We have the second highest number of organic farms out of any state in the country. Um, and one of the reasons why we are a leader is because of situations like we're seeing this winter. I, the winter is really a key tool in terms of managing um, insect pests organically and breaking up those cycles. And I think as we see potentially um, shift in, in warmer climate and more um, opportunities for to, for insects to overwinter, it's going to have a profound impact on our organic communities. And particularly also with field crops, um, with a spring like we had this spring, um, where organic farmers are very reliant on tillage to get out in the field in a timely manner and manage their weeds, um, it has a significant impact on, on yield. So the organic community may be a bit more sensitive to some of these changes, um, particularly with the reasons why organic is so centered here in Wisconsin. All right. I have a question for uh, Jeff and Aaron, and it's about sort of, you alluded to these in your uh, Patrick Kucha, but sort of what have you found with your, um, you know, your research? You know, are students willing to pay for certain types of organic or local food? You know, what, what is our student perceptions? And, you know, what are the potential impacts? Yeah. And I'll this? have Jeff answer this too. The survey um, will be conducted in the next week or two, so we haven't done the survey yet. And it's one of those situations, and I, there was a. Um, it, and this is not a phenomenon just with students, it's a phenomenon with, with um, consumers in general that um, you know, a survey may not be reflective of actual purchasing. They may say that they're going to buy something, but when it actually comes to paying that higher price, it may not be reflective in their actions. Um, but it, 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 from previous um, experiences with organic purchasing um, on the salad bar, and products, um, it was, yeah, the, the, the purchasing didn't necessarily reflect what some of the, the students were saying that they wanted to see. But I, I will let Jeff speak, because I think his approach really um, is, is optimizes student desires versus what he, his vision is as a chef. Well, actually, um, even though we do pay more for the greens, it, the, what, what the, the cost on the salad bar is not in the greens. And so I didn't have to raise the price to my student uh, customers. Um, and I've talked to Aaron about this. I mean, whether or not, <clears throat> if you walk in to one of my dining facilities and you know, you're gonna have a bacon cheeseburger that day and you see, hey, they've got local greens on the salad bar, that might not change your mind and you're gonna get a salad that day. But it changes people's perception of who we are and of what their choices are and most of our um, customers live with us and eat two or three meals a day with us. So uh, I think changing that perception about what we're committed to uh, and uh, the quality of the food and how uh, we stand for that, uh, to me, that's, that's a success, even if uh, we don't sell any more salad bar. And as I said to Aaron, I really don't want to sell any more of my salad bar. I don't, I don't do real well in it. So. Thank you. I want to follow up on the organic side of things in particular. Um, it's my understanding that actually soil is a large carbon sink and that today's agricultural practices that we've developed are actually not very good at storing carbon and that the agricultural practice, the older uh, practices that we're often returning to are much better. Do you see much uh, change in this direction going towards uh, things that would uh, create, make the soil be a much better carbon sink again? That, that's a question that I wouldn't um, necessarily um, put just on organic. And increasingly, we've seen interest across all agricultural sectors in cover cropping, which in terms of building soil organic matter and potentially um, increasing soil carbon um, is, is really a key practice. Uh, so. In you know, looking at long-term trial data and looking at the performance of organic versus conventional systems with respect to building soil organic matter, um, a lot of the soil building practices of organic do tend to um, mitigate any of the um, negative practices of, of tillage and cultivation that are incorporated into organic as a, as a weed management practice. Um, so I think it's one of those examples of really all agricultural sectors learning from each other and, and integrating best management practices. But it's, I mean, some of the concepts that are built into the National Organic Program and National Organic Rules, such as integration of cover crops, diverse crop rotation, um, that, that changes the amount of um, you know, root uh, biomass that's contributed to the system, um, the amount of um, above ground material that's returned back to the system um, do 
enhance the um, uh, building of soil organic matter and organic systems. But those practices aren't necessarily um, unique or um, confined only to organic systems. And a lot of conventional farmers are starting to adopt those practices as well. I'm afraid that's going to have to be our last question. Um, so thanks to all of you, and thanks very much to our panelists.